Hi everyone and welcome. Today I'm going to do a spoiler-free review of Kashiel's Dart by Jacqueline Carey. This is the first book in the Phaedra trilogy, which is the first trilogy in a longer nine book long series called Kashiel's Legacy. So if you do end up picking up this first book and liking it, there are a lot of other books in this same world to sink your teeth into. And I will definitely be doing that very soon because, spoiler alert, I absolutely adored this first book. This has potential to become an all-time favorite, so this will be a very positive gush review. However, I can definitely see that this is not the book that is for everyone, especially because of some content warnings that I will be getting into very soon. And that will become quite clear when I talk about the lore and the religion in this world, which is extremely important in order to understand the plot of this first book. So in this world, especially the country of Terre d'Anche, we have a religion that's very reminiscent of Christianity. There was a messiah, this messiah died at the cross, but unlike Christianity, from the blood of his wounds, the tears of a woman and the earth, a second messiah was born, Eloah. Eloah roamed the world together with his apostles, and one of these apostles was called Nama. Now, Nama sold her body numerous times in order to save Eloah and his apostles. And because of this, sex is now, in current time, a religious act, and it is almost something to worship Eloah and Nama. And now we have the most sacred command, love as thou wilt. Now, Eloah roamed the world, and in the end, he settled down in the country of Terre d'Anche. And there he had a lot of offspring, the other apostles had a lot of offspring, and now the people who live in Terre d'Anche still have that small droplet of divine blood running through their veins. And this is the backdrop of the main story in the first book. We meet our main character, Phaedra, when she's very young and she lives in one of these night houses. Now, night houses are a very strange combination of prostitution houses and temples, because there they actually worship Nama and they are specialized in different types of physical pleasure. Phaedra, even though she is very young, has one dream and that is to become a servant of Nama. And when she is 8 or 10 years old, her mark gets bought by Delani. Now, Delani is now her master, he is her tutor, and for the outside world, he is continuing her education to become a servant of Nama. And when she is of a certain age, he will find patrons for her to bestow physical pleasure on them. But behind closed doors, Delani is actually involved in a very intricate and difficult web of political intrigue. And he's actually using his pupils, he has two, one of them is Phaedra, to become spies. And they will bring him very sensitive information that they get from their patrons and that he otherwise would not have access to. So I think that here you can definitely see Yes, there is going to be some very, or there are going to be some very explicit scenes in this first book, and especially in the first half, I would say. But this is heavily tied into both the world, the lore, and also tied into the political intrigue. So this is not a book like Agatha, where there is smut, just for the sake of reading smut is enjoyable. Here it's much more serious, there's a lot more at stake. And even though there are not that many scenes, I would say a handful, they are told very explicit and in detail. And these scenes do take place and cover multiple pages. But you cannot skim them, even if you don't like the type of content, because you get so much information during those scenes, and because it is important to bring together these puzzle pieces, you need to read them. So I think that this is the main drawback and why a lot of people will not enjoy this series. However, I ended up absolutely adoring it because the political intrigue is just so good. What I absolutely adored is that this is told from first-person POV, and our main POV, our only POV, of course, is Phaedra. And Phaedra, in the beginning, needs to put together these pieces. Because yes, Delaney is involved in this web of political intrigue, but Fader doesn't know what his role is exactly, what he is trying to achieve, and why he needs this information. So because of this, you are also wondering, why is this important, and what do I need to pay a lot of attention to? And I really liked that amount of attention. What I absolutely adore in first-person POV as well, it's one of my favorite ways of telling a story, is that you are watching the story through painted glasses or colored glasses almost. For example, Phaedra absolutely adores Delaney. And because of this, you adore him as well. But, and this is more fuel for a spoiler-filled discussion, is Delaney actually a good guy? That's something that, because you are watching it from Freda's POV, you actually don't really think about it, but it's quite interesting to delve deeper into that. Another point of view, or another way that Phaedra looks at certain people and that can have an effect on how you look at them, are the antagonists. There are definitely some antagonists here, and Phaedra has very mixed feelings 
towards them. On the one hand, they did atrocious things. And even if you look at it from an objective point of view, you will hate them. But because Phaedra also has a personal vendetta against them, you hate them even more. And especially because she has a lot of history with some of these, this leads to very mixed feelings that Phaedra has and now you have as well. So I really like that subjective form of storytelling. Also, one of my favorite tropes is when the main character is telling you their life story, and this is what happens here. Phaedra, much older Phaedra, is telling you from the start, from when she was a young girl, how everything happened in her life. And this adds a nice tension of foreboding. This happens in the Farseer trilogy, in the Kingkiller Chronicles, and I just absolutely love it. Where something happens that seems to be not that important, Phaedra is doing an errand, and because of that, she cannot join another person. But then Phaedra, our narrator, our storyteller, says, at that time, I was very excited to do that errand. But looking back, because of this, I missed some very important information and I wish that I went with that other person. And this immediately raises the stakes. And now you want to know what happened there and what kind of information did she miss. So I really like that added tension. Now, Jacqueline Carey has a beautiful writing style. I had to get used to it in the first couple of chapters, but afterwards I thought that it flowed nicely. But she definitely uses more words than she needs to. Now, I really like that. I like it when an author pays a lot of attention to their writing style and it's not just a means to convey the story, but it's more and it's more an art in itself. But yes, it happens. Although I do think that it adds to Fader's character. Now, I did already tell you about a little bit of the world building and about Terendange, but there are also other cultures, cultures that are reminiscent of Vikings, but also cultures that are very similar to the Picts. And I really like how the world opens up in this first book. I also like that we have a change of setting and I think that this switch between the different settings happened at the ideal time point where because we switched away from something I was still sad because it was still very important and very interesting there but when we switched I was immediately invested in that new story. I also think that this and how the plot went was very important for some character developments because I will not tell you about what the specific or who the specific characters are, but there are certain characters who really do a complete 180. And I think that this is very difficult to do. Often it doesn't really feel like this is happening organically, but because of the change of plot and what happens to these characters, it actually fits. And I think that that's the best way of storytelling where your character development and your plot just organically meet in the middle and it feels like this happens naturally. So I really enjoyed that, the opening up of the world and how we get back to the beginning point towards the end and how just really felt like a concluded story even if this is the first of a trilogy i do think that the main story of the first book is concluded quite nicely towards the end now in terms of magic this is not a high magic type of story like i said the world is very reminiscent of our own if you would draw the map it almost feels like you would draw france for terdange then of course the more skaldic countries for the vikings and then britain for these picked like People. So it's very reminiscent, it's not high magic, it's not an epic fantasy world. And also the magic in itself, most of it is just the fact that we have this religion and that you actually need to believe that what happened with Eloa is true. This is not a religion like Christianity or the Islam in our own world, this is actually part of the history here. And the people that we follow in Terdange are descendants of these apostles, of these saints and of these godlike creatures almost. We also have, of course, Kashil's Dart, the title of the book, and this means that Phaedra is actually touched by one of these apostles called Kashil. She has a red spot in her eye. This is shown that she is touched by Kashil's Dart, and this means that she will always feel pain together with pleasure. And of course, this is where the BDSM aspect takes part. A lot of these sex scenes are BDSM related. Now, this is all done with consent, and there is a safe word. So how all of this takes place, I do think is quite okay in that sense. I'm not an expert at all, but I do think that this is portrayed very well. However, I do want to give some trigger warnings for rape as well as torture. Now, this does not happen in the scene of this religious end of the world, but there are other things that take place in the plot and you do have rape. Now, this is not a very aggressive type of rape, so I do think that some people might not see it as that, but in my opinion, it's very clear. It's there and it is also quite graphic. The torture scene is only one scene and I think that if you want to, you could definitely skim it. It's not that long, but it is there and it is explained in graphic detail. So please be aware of that. 
And even though we don't have a lot of high fantasy elements, we do have a couple and I would say not more than two or three. Now, I do think that for some people this might be jarring because this is a low fantasy world, there aren't any magic system, these people don't have any magical abilities, and then all of a sudden you have some high magic creatures that might show up. For me personally, I didn't mind it. I also didn't need it because I was pretty comfortable in this low magic world. But when it happened, I do think that it was fitting. However, at that point, I was so in love with this first book that I don't think that I would have found anything bothersome. And I have heard from other people that this felt jarring to them and that they wished that there wasn't that high magic element in a low magic book. But all in all, do not expect magic systems, do not expect people with very high level magical abilities, because that's not it. You need to pick up this book most of all if you want to have a character driven story and high level political intrigue. So of course, I absolutely adore Kushiel's Dart, I don't know if you noticed, and this definitely has potential to become one of my top 10 all time favorite series. If you are interested what my top 10 are as of now, when I have not finished this series yet, definitely watch this video next. But I will be reading Kashil's Chosen pretty soon and yes, I have very high hopes. Please let me know if you're interested and if this review was helpful. As always, I hope that you enjoyed the video and see you next time. Bye!